Hello and welcome to the session on universal governments and universal care plans. Uh, let me uh, wait a few minutes to get my colleagues into the room. Wow, Anil, I can see you in the room. Awesome. Hello, Sam. Hello, Anil. <laughs> Finally got in. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> what was going on. You know? Yeah. I was, oh, uh, they had my, some wrong email. So, so, oh. so this email has been updated now, so. All right, all right, good, good, good. Wow, so are you in New Zealand now? Yes, I'm in, yeah, I'm in New Zealand. Yeah. So that's where I live. Wow, what time is it at your end now? Uh, it is just after 10 a.m. in the morning on Saturday. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and, and whereabouts are you, Sam? I'm in Atlanta at the moment. All right, right. Okay. Yeah. And it's uh, past 4 p.m. Yeah. I've already had one uh, meeting. My work is very global. So I right. just had a um, an hour and a half long meeting with Florida this morning. Wow. So that's my daily life. You know, so. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's a, I'm very uh, well-versed with uh, time <laughs> Work in the U.S. time zones. Right. <laughs> Amazing. So I am expecting our other panelists to join us. Um, we had a test run on Tuesday, and we had two of them. Two of, two of them uh, joined in with a test run. Uh, one person took excuse or Jose from Spain uh, that his plans changed. <coughs> so right. uh, let me see if we can get them in as quick as possible since our time is running already. Awesome. 
<laughs> Hello, Pam. Hello. I'm sorry for a few minutes delay. <laughs> I hope you had no trouble connecting. <laughs> the connecting wasn't a problem because now I knew the drill. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, so. I'm always traumatized about connecting here because <laughs> last year also I had the same issue and they have my yeah. old email. Yeah, so there are like two connect, two links. So one of them does not work. And there's one that works. So um, <clears throat> I was able to, last time with Sam, with his help, I was able to connect with one of them. And I cut and paste into my, <laughs> ah. <laughs> into my calendar. I'm like, this is the one works. And then I forget because my default is set up to um, uh, Internet Explorer. So it doesn't work with that at all. It, it works with Chrome, so you have to cut and paste into Chrome. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you figured it out. <laughs> we figured it out. <laughs> so are we only three of us, or there's more people coming? So far, there are three of us. Um, we have Girish from India. Hi, Girish. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so, well, this is Anil here from New Anil, Zealand. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And, and Pam is based in Boston, right? Yes. <laughs> and where are you, Anil? Uh, I'm based out of Auckland, New Zealand. Okay, got it. <laughs> nice <So>. place. <laughs> it's a very nice place. Um, um, yeah, it's a Saturday morning here. Um, Amazing. Wow. So how early is it Saturday morning? Uh, just after 10 a.m. Okay, so that's, that, that's not bad. It's not that no. very, very early. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I used to be a part of the, the World Economic Forum uh, Biotechnology Council, and we had people from all over the world in our group. And it was, there's always somebody dialing around 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. I'm so, on the Council for Mental Health at World Economic Forum, so I'm used to attending those meetings too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Girish had mentioned, because he's in India, so he had said that it would be about 2.30 a.m. at his end. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. 2.30 a.m. is a really bad one. Right. That's a real bad one. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, if it's at midnight, it's okay. If it's yeah. 4 a.m., it's okay. 2.30, but not good. <laughs> you should be in deep sleep. <laughs> At that time, all right, I guess we'll just get going since our time is running already. So, so 4.30, um, our session starts at 4.30, uh, well, 4 starting my time, but in five minutes, right? Oh, well, our session started 4.15. No, 4.15 was the um, just the preparation, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what yeah, I thought. Preparation, 4.30. Right. Eastern is when Eastern. the session starts. At least that's what I got from Frank. All right, right, right. Okay. So, so we have five minutes if you want to wait for... For Girish to join us, right? And yeah, we have some people in the room. We want to say a big thank you to you, uh, Victoria and Charles. Thank you for joining us. We hope to have an interesting discussion here on governments and universal care plans. Um, so we hope Girish can join us. Um, Jose from Spain said something came up, but he might still be able to join us.
So, Pam, did you attend the um, practice session the other day? Um, so, <laughs> I was having really difficult time, so I missed the time, but I was able to, you know, Sam was kind enough to give me time afterwards, so we, we connected briefly. And All right. All right. So you are more well briefed than I am. Uh, so look, I'm I'm, I'm going to take a global perspective, um, uh, even though I'm based out of Auckland, New Zealand, but I do work in the US and Europe uh, a lot. Uh, so I'll just probably uh, take the cue from where the conversation is heading and probably contribute as required. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to, you know, also, you know, see where the conversation goes you know we'll have the sam as our driver <laughs> of the conversation and we'll follow his lead <laughs> right okay well um i i know we we our panelists have a lot to say on the subject but i'll just do i mean open the session and then we'll give each person some three to four minutes to introduce themselves and then give opening remarks then we'll begin to take the issues one at a time um i did said i sent some thoughts or some questions ahead yep, yep. right so uh, sam i've just received a message from uh frank saying the session is live it can be started now all right good thank you Okay, so I want to say a big thank you to everyone, especially first to uh, my co-panelists uh, for the honor of being a part of this session, and especially for me for chairing it, because our original chair was unable to make this session. Um, we are discussing government and universal care plans. Now, this, this is a big topic, uh, and I'd like to say a big thank you to our audience, too, uh, who are in already listening in on us. Somewhere along the line, towards the end of the discussion, we would ask you to introduce yourself and give us your thoughts. Okay, so um, there's a global... Let me introduce myself first. I am Sam at DME. I am a leadership coach and consultant, although I trained originally as a civil engineer. Uh, somewhere along the line, I decided to focus on enhancing human capacity. And especially because I grew up in Nigeria, in Africa, and I struggled personally after my graduation from college, unable to get the job and despaired about the future, wanted to find out, is there really a system that creates success? And eventually I, I began to read a lot. <laughs> and then I found out along the line, I knew so much I could share with other people because I began to apply the principles and get results. So I went on radio and began to teach people basic principles for achieving success. At the end of the day, I realized when you really succeed, you, you help other people to succeed. That's the height of it. And that's what we call leadership anyway. So I then went on, got my master's degree in leadership studies and got the doctor of strategic leadership degree. I founded a leadership school in Nigeria. We call it the Daystar Leadership Academy. 20 years ago, it's graduated over 45,000 people. It's a nonprofit, but we teach basic uh, leadership and management principles, but now I consult for organizations. Um, so today we're discussing governments and universal care plans. I think the, the basic thought for me is the fact that the greatest asset that any country has are the human beings, are the citizens. And as we move into the future, we've been told over and over, there's going to be a global fight for talent. So investing in public health just has to remain huge priority for every government. Now, this applies to different parts of the world in different ways. And I'm expecting that as we go through this discussion today, 
uh, we'll be able to look from those different perspectives because you have the developed economies with aging, uh, the aging population. You have the developing economies with a large youth population. And I think that's a huge opportunity on its own. So uh, I believe that our distinguished panelists will do justice to this topic today. I want to say a big thank you once again to everyone for joining us. So let me move on to Pam. Can you please introduce yourself and give us your first remarks? Well, thank you, Sam. It's such a pleasure to share this panel with you and Anil, and I'm very excited about the discussion that's going to take place. Um, Just to introduce myself, I'm Pam Randhava, founder and CEO of of Empirico, an early stage biotech company. We're focused on antiviral uh, therapies and next generation of personalized diagnostics for early disease detection, drug monitoring, and treating at-risk patients more effectively at home. Um, I also I serve on the board of uh, Hercules Capital. It's a a venture debt company, um, uh, uh, about uh, $13 billion under management. Um, I also serve on the board of directors of Mass Life Science Center. It's our state of Massachusetts investment fund of $1.6 billion. We invest in life sciences innovation um, and create jobs in Massachusetts. Um, uh, I also serve on Mass Bio. I'm currently vice chair, moving into a chair in a month. Uh, and uh, it's our industry association and advocacy group for um, for biopharma. Um, and and just to give my remarks around this really important topic of of uh, you know universal plans or plans specifically that includes aging as as uh, overall sort of the part of uh, um, uh, infrastructure. Um, as people age, as population ages, and they live longer, you know, increasing numbers of people are, you know, impacted by substantial health challenges, uh, multiple chronic diseases that come along as we age, uh, and progressive disabilities. Um, and, you know, we require assistance and, you know, adopting new environments and different environments. We used to be able to run up and down the stairs, couldn't do that anymore. Um, so those are the things that happen. Uh, but if you just look at, you know, just to frame this this sort of a macro challenge. I just want to go through a couple of statistics around what's happening around the world. And of course, I'm U.S.-based, so some of my statistics are more U.S.-focused. But the World Health Organization, you know, estimate about 3.9 billion people around the world do not get adequate health services. Um, And approximately 100 million people are pushed into, you know, extreme poverty because of -of out-of-pocket cost of the healthcare. Um, And their share of -of out-of-pocket is really substantially higher, which is about 41% according to the World Health Organization, compared to in in the low to middle-income countries, compared with 22% 22% in the high income countries. So, you know, it's like a double, triple whammy of, of, of people living in the low to middle income company, countries spending a lot more out of pocket compared with, with the high income countries. Now, if I take a view of the US population, you know, according to the US, according to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, you know, we're reaching $6 trillion in healthcare spending by 2027. That's approximately 20% of our GDP. And if we actually look at, if we take sort of a slice further of, um, um, a, you know, elderly population, you know, the concentration of medical spending is so concentrated, concentrated among like the top 5%, um, you know, spenders, they spend about like 98000 almost $100,000 a year. Um, on, 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 on cost. And um, overall, the average is about 14000 So you can only imagine how many folds that those 5% actually spend on. And the out-of-pocket is even worse. The out-of-pocket is even more skewed. You know, they spend almost half of the, all the out-of-pocket, the top 5%. So, you know, where I'm going with this is, is the, the health challenges and, you know, sort of the, the other challenges that comes along and that adds to that cost. Um, you know, this is 
you know, the, uh, the spending that's out of pocket that happens, it's beyond above and beyond their primary and secondary and the public assistance that they get. So this is, this is quite a bit. Now, if you take a slightly later stage um, on the nursing home side in the U.S., an average is, you know, out of pocket for those who do not qualify for uh, uh, medical assistance, you know, if they are below 100% poverty level or they've exhausted all their resources and all their resources mean they have only $2,000 in their bank account, uh, which means, so they are spending, you know, anywhere from over 100,000 to over 200,000 in that range, depending on what type of nursing home they're in. Um, it's a massive, you know, financial burden um, to the individuals, you know, so beyond just the, the financial burden, you know, there's a daily beyond the, the, the medical burden, there's a daily living that they, there's a cost associated with the daily living. That's also a major burden. And, you know, most of the um, uh, adult value, you know, living at home and being independent and, and not being burdened on their families and, and, and financially or otherwise. And according to uh, researchers at Stanford, they concluded that um, as much the older adults want to be at home and being independent, uh, majority of them actually end up not being independent or at home. Uh, in fact, that they concluded that 71% of the Americans, um, you know, they die in a hospital. And 73, I mean, 73% actually end up dying in the hospital. 71% of them prefer to be at home. So it's the opposite scenario than what people want. And more of this sort of the 25% of the overall sort of the elderly spending, um, older adults, um, is, it happens in the later stage of the life. So I think my point here is that we have a huge, you know, cost uh, a, a, a burden and, and a living burden as well. Um, you know, not to mention mental health, you know, the social isolation of elderly um, is to me is 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 a really conti that contributes to the cognitive cognitive decline and a physical decline. Uh, in fact, that um, this group the, the re of the researchers uh, from um, Stanford they identified a program called uh, Age Well, and um, they conducted actually this study and 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 they they had uh, people go and visit other elderly who were in better shape, they would go visit uh, chronically ill patients in the hospital or nursing home and so forth. And they found that actually can reduce the readmission within 30 days, the readmission, they can reduce by 25%. Just the visitation from other elderly or other people who are, you know, in a, in a slightly better shape. So I think that there are, there is so much to be desired for what can happen as we age and during this progression, you know, what can be done. And these are the challenges that I don't think we can address with one or two or three solutions. It is a really multi-dimensional approach, you know, anywhere from building an, a public health infrastructure that actually specializes not just the clinical care, but the long-term care, you know, and what, what that long-term care looks like, coordination, uh, regarding housing, you know, personal care workforce, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, understanding the cohorts of people that can be at home taken care of and the cohorts of the people that really will need some kind of institutional type of care. Um, you know, technologies uh, can also make a huge difference. Uh, but a lot of those disruptive technologies are sort of priced out. They're expensive. So that means that we need to have more public and private type of uh, investments and innovation that needs to take place as part of the overall public health infrastructure that allows for, you know, affordable drugs, you know, affordable diagnostics, affordable and accessible, you know, devices and so forth. Um, and preventive care specifically, you know, there needs to be incentives for different, you know, business models. Uh, for preventive care. So we can actually reduce the, the progression of, of uh, or slows the progression of the disease um, uh, and, and have more sort of the mobility of, of, of these individuals. So I think all of these things could be part of a multi-pronged approach, uh, public, private, and individual. 
individuals. And, uh, you know, this can happen, but this is where we need to go with the public health system around the world. And it may be different for, you know, develop, you know, high income countries versus low income to middle income countries. But this is where we need to look at more taking a, a, an integrated, more holistic approach uh, to addressing this kind of a problem because it's not going away. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you for giving us such a broad view, broad and at the same time in-depth view of this issue, and especially the multifaceted dimension of it. Thank you so, so much. Well, Anil, thank you for being a part of our panel. Can you please introduce yourself and give us your thoughts? Thank you, Sam. Um, what a great... Uh, Thoughts you shared with us, Pam. Uh, really appreciate that. So my uh, name is Anil uh, Taplial. I'm based out of Auckland, New Zealand, and but um, my role is quite global. So I'm, I'll expand on that very shortly. So I'm the CEO of Health Tracks um, and Global, and that uh, organization uh, focusing just on the role of digital in mental health, how to improve access to care and treatment. So that's been the passion and focus of the last 25 years of my professional life. And then for my deep-seated interest in this and looking at how do we, uh, not looking at uh, the innovation part of it, but looking at more of implementation focus as to how do we get the implementation right? Because uh, there are a lot of um, early stage um, innovation, great innovation ideas which haven't got the rigor of implementation. So, so, so I was asked by the United States government in uh, 2011 to chair an international body um, uh, to, on role of digital and mental health. And, uh, and that body is now an organization called, it's a charity, international charity called E-Mental Health International Collaborative. And I got appointed in 2015 as its uh, executive and director. So the two roles, Health Tracks and EMIC, and um, they're both focusing on the same um, sort of area of uh, role of digital uh, in mental health. So, uh, so we hold every year uh, uh, E-Mental Health International Congress, uh, which is uh, in November last year. Uh, it's, uh, so there are five components to that uh, Congress, all the work which we do. Um, one of them is the lived experience. So looking at the people who um, um, have been through the uh, mental illness themselves, have done a recovery. So what we're saying is if it doesn't work for the person with the lived experience, the families and the carers, no innovation works at all then. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's point number one. Uh, so we need to, uh, how do we ensure that the people with the lived experience are part of the genuine authentic good co-design uh, to for the design development and implementation number two is um, why innovate um, are we solving a problem in washington dc are we follow, solving, following solving a problem in canberra in australia or in wellington in new zealand or london or where, whichever nation's capital or so there must be a problem statement so so, for example, uh, if New Zealand government um, says our uh, total uh, national suicide stats, 71% of those are um, men. Uh, so maybe it's a male suicide um, uh, is the number one priority in mental health. But is it? Or uh, five times women attempt, but they are not successful. <laughs> five times more <laughs> So is self-harm the priority? So government will decide based on the statistics they have on hand. So looking at what pain point is it wanting to solve um, in that particular context. So we look at, all right, so innovation, the fit with the strategy. Then the third one is who says it works? You know, we got every university under the sun I know of, and I, I work with majority of them uh, very closely. They're innovating, amazing, great ideas. Um, so, so we must marry the science of evidence-based approaches uh, with what people end up receiving. The fourth one is looking at, uh, you can throw the best possible solutions under the sun uh, at the, um, uh, into the mix of uh, solutions that are out there. But if the uh, frontline uh, physician, clinician, they don't need to be registered. One, they could be the gateway worker or could be anybody. If they don't know this innovation exists, how can they use it at the right point in time in person's care? So looking at the fit with the care continuum. 
And the first one is, I always say, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, there's a role for everyone to play, whether it be Vodafone, Amazon Web Services, every sales force, you name it. So we there is a different uh, room for the different touch points, different players to play, because most of our services which we are behind, they are national in nature, so they are across. So they need to be scalable at a national level, state level. So what does it mean? So, so what I say is the only way to create symphony is let each instrument play player play their own instrument. Don't try to learn piano when you know you play a violin the best. So that's kind of a very high level. And so one statistics before um, I probably um, move on to the larger discussion is uh, at the last year's Congress, uh, statistics were shared by um, a U.S. Uh, scientist. Uh, 70% of the people in America uh, were out of the 100%. Only 30% of the people are able to access any form of mental health care. 70% are not able to access mental health care. So what happens mm-hmm. to that? So is um, are they not accessing services? Are there not enough um, uh, care providers? So, so the thing is, 70% is a staggering number. This is uh, uh, by any means. So what is the role of digital in all of that? And how do we create population-based approaches? And um, and some of the statistics, staggering numbers which um, uh, Pam shared, uh, also alludes to because our nature of our organization, the Pan Global, the funding models. You know, some countries we have um, national healthcare systems, so the whole uh, provision of healthcare system and how things get um, implemented across the nation, uh, as opposed to some countries where. Uh, the whole uh, funding mortalities are a lot different. So just wanted to leave that as a food for thought and happy to expand as we go along. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anil. Wow. You both have given us some some food for thought. <laughs> as it is, the truth is this issue is multidimensional. Multidimensional. Um, so Pam, you you operate in the R&D sector. Um, technology, like you mentioned earlier on, is going to play a big role, a huge role going forward. So my doctor recommended for me to have a test some time ago. Um, it was a heart scan. <clears throat> and it was when I was signing in that the lady at the desk asked me, did they tell you how much this was going to cost? I, I said, no. W- what's it like? She said, well, it's $8,750. It's $8,750. I said, what? She said, okay. No, no, no. The first thing she said was, well, you are, you are going to pay uh, $1,750. I said, is that the whole thing or my copay? She said, no, your copay, the whole thing is $8,750. I said, what? One test? Okay, the technology is there quite all right. Amazing technology, and the question, gratefully, the test went, it was all clear, it was good. But the question on my mind is, how many people are going to be able to afford that with the technology? Will the technology make things expensive? If the technology comes to make things better, but it is expensive, how are we going to be able to fund that? How how is the average person going to be able to afford that kind of a thing? So... So the question on my mind, you know, is um, do you foresee the innovation of financial instruments being commensurate to the innovation in technology? Yeah, I think that's a very valid and, and a great point that you bring is that what good is technology if people cannot access it or they cannot afford it? And we've seen that with, you know, newer type of technology, cell or gene therapy or CRISPR, you know, those are the technologies that cost a couple couple million dollars a year. Who even in America, people cannot afford that. And and so those are not feasible. However, the good news is there are a number of companies that are coming, you know, more frequently that are looking into new models where they can make affordable medications uh, where companies can um, not only from an innovation perspective, but also the operational innovation, 
you know, throughout sort of the life cycle of the development uh, and commercialization, the innovation can take place in every single area. So I think this is why I said uh, in my remarks earlier was that um, innovation doesn't come just from a one sort of the source. It can come from a multi-source, whether it's uh, investments into these innov innovations, uh, whether it's, uh, it's really looking for new R&D model, whether it's looking for new business model, new operational models throughout the value chain of the drug development, for example, or the device or diagnostics. Um, I think the innovation needs to really keep in mind uh, that it cannot be just the uh, the Western world or the, the the high income countries, we need to really look at globally. And if I could just take it as as a uh, an example of uh, <clears throat> you know sort of a personal uh, my own passion and and the, the company when I founded you know almost ten years ago, what was sort of uh, what we had in mind. Um, you know, we spent quite a bit time on building a platform that allows us to make drugs than cheaper, small molecule drugs. Uh, we're originally initially uh, focused on infectious diseases and antiviral is our first sort of the compound pipeline currently. Um, but the goal is that can we actually develop these drugs, you know, instead of 10, 15 years, can we actually make them in less than five years? Can we actually reduce the cost overall? Can we make it as a fraction of the cost? And we believe now that we're further along enough that we can do that. It took us 10 years to build a platform. Uh, and But now the applications we can, we can come out, um, it does require heavy investment. And we had to look for non-traditional models of investments. We couldn't go to the traditional, you know, venture capitalist or, or private equity uh, because the model that we've created, you know, mm -hmm. there's a platform for, you know, drug development, and then there's a platform for diagnostics. And what we are trying to do is close close the loop between the patient outcomes and drug development. We want to be able to feed what was the experience in the real world of these patients? And can we actually improve these products moving forward? So overall cost that we can reduce, whether it's a development of drugs or whether it's treating of the patients, you know, combination of those. These are the types of things that really requires innovative models, you know, from a financing perspective, as well as from a development perspective. Just to give you an idea on the diagnostic side, we are miniaturizing instruments that are currently like a million dollar, a half a room full of, of, of instrument that takes a half a room. Um, and we're miniaturizing the size of a laptop and reducing the cost from a million dollars to a few thousand dollars. And then the individual test of a 50 cents to a dollar that it could be afforded in India or you know Africa or anywhere else does take a commitment um, from uh, you know, uh, companies from uh, governments, from, you know, uh, ecosystem in general, and it can happen. Uh, I do think that many companies, at least I am familiar with in the U.S., are working towards those types of models because it has to take place from R&D to financing, you know, of those innovations and the operational models uh, that has to take place. One other thing that I do think also has to take place is if the technologies are developed uh, in the US, for example, or, or Europe, or um, let's say high income countries, they need to work in the low to middle income country where you may not have infrastructure. So just the device example that I gave, uh, if you don't make it robust enough, that could be in any kind of environment, 120 degrees temperature. I was born and raised in, in part of India that, you know, it could go to 120 degrees. So it needs to be able to survive. There are villages. There's no power in villages. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the, we used to have sandstorms. So this is a device that highly sensitive has to work in those environments. And it has to be affordable. It has to be accessible. Uh, and so those are the types of things that I do think that more and more companies, more coming from a private sector. And I'm hoping that the, the government sector would go behind those as well. 
um, and and back those types of companies and 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 make these things happen because you know the economy is global we are global we cannot be sitting in america and saying that we didn't don't need to worry about the rest of the world it cannot happen that way we've seen that with pandemic has opened our eyes and we've seen that if you have a condition in another part of the world that will come here and so we need to be responsible for that so i i do think that sam to your question that um these models are moving in that direction it's a little bit slow but it is moving in that direction Thank you, Pam. <laughs> that is cherry news, I should say. <laughs> Thank you for giving us so much insight along these lines. Um, well, the system has alerted us that actually our time is in about a minute. Um, Anil, any closing thoughts? I, th- I just think um, that we are talking about older adults or aging population. Uh, so I just think uh, there is uh, something which uh, Pam also touched on, uh, loneliness. Um, uh, we are also aware of uh, so much for, uh, the, you know, the honeymoon sort of around when I'm going to retire, a lot of people turning to alcohol. Um, so we are we are talking about things which we normally don't associate with aging. Mm-hmm. Um, there is uh, some great uh, work that is happening uh, when we talk about e-mental health or the role of digital in mental health. People think it's some, uh, something for the young people. The reality is uh, how we are communicating. There was a UK-based research which just came out a couple of years ago, which talks about how we are communicating these days and making phone call from your smartphone is did not make it to top 10 activities within that survey. It was a number 11 activity. Number one was texting. And then, you know, all the social media, the email, the banking. My God. So so unless whatever we are doing in the healthcare, if it's not commensurate with the way people are communicating themselves. So we are talking about older people as well. They are doing all of that, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so my thinking is, uh, I think whatever we provide must match with the way that today's patients uh, are expecting us to deliver those services through. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Anil. Well, um, they give us a few extra minutes. I want to say a big thank you to Gary Whitehill for joining us and blessing IMA. Um, Gentlemen, I don't know if you have any questions for our panelists or any thoughts you would like to express before we close. Okay, it looks like um, we're all good. Um, <clears throat> that's a that, that's a question on my mind. Just before we go, <laughs> and you may just be able to help me with it. it it's um, it's the low income economies and the population demographics. The difference is just so huge that while you have the, an aging population in the high income economies, you have this huge youth population in the low income economies. And I think that changes the dynamics, right? Um, What should governments be doing with this large youth population? What should government focus on with respect to the adult education? For the most part, it appears they can't even afford, you know, to take care of the aging population. Should the, resp- should the younger generation prepare, you know, to take care of their parents and grandparents? <laughs> it, since, we, since we operate in developing economies and gratefully also globally, do we have any ideas, especially for governments in low-income economies? I'll ask Pam to go first, then Anil and then we'll close the session. You know, I I don't uh, have much of experience on the low to middle income economies and, um, you know, the role of governments. You know, there are some governments that have, uh, uh, you know, worked on, I mean, obviously there are, uh, you know, 
you, you know, there, there, there's sort of number of different models, you know, you can look at the socialist medicine, you can look at the national health care, you can look at the single payer, you know, there are pros and cons to all of them, right? right? And and so I think, you know, I am sort of a proponent of that the preventive medicine should be, you know, there needs to be a strong public health sector where the private sector can plug in. And because the private sector can make the environment more competitive and perhaps you know, uh, more efficient. And, and uh, I think that between that type of a partnership, uh, I do believe, I'm, I'm really a firm believer that the preventive medicine is, is really is the key. And you mentioned about the younger population, uh, you know, specifically, if we can actually have the pre- prevention, uh, prevention is better than cure, preventive medicine early on, um, if we can have the infrastructure that supports that, to me, we would have a much better aging process. Um, so that's a one one area. Uh, but certainly, uh, having the, the the strong public health system that's centered around the prevention, and that also include the mental health um, aspect of it, and then having a system that's flexible enough that the private sector can plug in. And as we age in different stages of our life, that we are able to access those services. So I think it's a combination of public-private partnership. Um, In terms of the families, I do think that will never go away um, because the families can actually make a huge difference, specifically when it comes to the, you know, cognitive abilities and mental health for um, elderly population. I've seen that in my own family, my father, um, you know, his journey to towards, uh, uh, you know, aging. And um, I think you can make a huge difference as a family, just this, just the kindness, the love, the care that the family provides, no institution can provide. So I think that that remains, you know, part of this whole puzzle. Um, mm-hmm. um, but you know, heavy lifting from a family as a financial burden um, or a full-time care, um, that's unrealistic. I think it's very difficult. Um, and you know, in some cases or many, most cases, people just cannot do it. So I think this is where you, know, you have a government that can play a major role. Thank you. Brilliant, Bob. Wow. Thank you so much. Anil? Any thoughts? Yeah, and no, I was just thinking, uh, reflecting on what Pam has also touched on, uh, prevention, and I'm always a big fan of population health approaches as to what does it even mean. Um, uh, when we are talking about is uh, uh, only one third of the population being aware of and being able to access the mental health care that they need. Does it mean the uh, two thirds don't matter? Uh, uh, so, uh, so what are those population health approaches? There are more than four hundred thousand e-health solutions uh, out there right now. More than four hundred thousand uh, solutions. There are five million digital health downloads a day, every single day around the world. So, whether we believe in e-health or not, it's happening right now. But unfortunately, of those four hundred thousand solutions. Only 29.3% of those are safe and effective. Rest of the, them cause harm. So how do we ensure as uh, commissioners, administrators of uh, systems of care that what our populations are accessing are safe and effective? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you so much, Anil. <laughs> That's a bit thought-provoking. Um, <laughs> Dr. Blessing Ayeme, uh, I think you want to make a contribution or ask a question. Good. Uh, just a second. Good. I think you can speak now. Right. <laughs> right. 
like I'm a member of the panel now. <laughs> great, nice to be here. Um, great discussion, uh, insightful. I wanted to um, contribute two things. One is um, the the key attention that needs to be given to um, income inequality, you know, as the population rise, we continue to see income inequality. How do we address, you know, um, the health challenges, especially with regards to um, chronic diseases that we'll see continue to rise, either as a result of um, the effects of the environment or as a result of eating habits um, that we have these days. How do we address that? Why we can't stop people um, from eating what they want to eat and living where they want to live? The cost comes back to the government. Um, I, I, I hear one of the panelists, um, I think Pam, did um, talk about um, primary care. Um, I think that is the direction for some places. How is this being handled, especially in the United States? What is being done about primary health care? Um, uh, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I, I just missed you. Uh, you said uh, something healthcare. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't hear. If you don't mind repeating your question. Okay, I, I was um, making reference to um, how is government going to deal with the growing inequality um, as it relates to. Um, income disparity as the population grow uh, we continue to see income disparity um healthcare issues are there there are chronic diseases that are springing up every day how do we address this and i ended up by asking the question as regards what is the united states government doing for example to address focus on primary health care as opposed to secondary and tertiary care Okay, so pri primary health care. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a really great question. And, and you know, I mentioned the statistics around, uh, you know, 400 million people around, you know, globally are pushed into extreme poverty uh, because of the out-of-pocket expense. And even when we look at in the U.S., you know, out-of-pocket expense in the last, uh, I would say, a decade has gone so, so you know, even the, the upper middle class feels that. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, even though we have a program for uh, uh, people who are below 100 percent poverty line uh, Medicaid program, and it's actually a great program. I mean, in terms of uh, coverage, I have actually worked on on uh, both Medicaid and Medicare. So Medicaid is for the poor. Medicare is for the elderly. Um, I've actually done quite a bit epidemiological patient outcomes research type of studies. Um, and uh, so. So it's a, it's a great program that covers pretty high end services in end to end. They have so much better than the upper middle class that actually are employer supported. Um, so to me, I'm more worried about that population than uh, the population below 100 percent poverty level. Um, and, and so uh, I do think that affording the, the health care has become a more and more uh, uh, difficult for that population. Um, and I do think something needs to happen, um, uh, you know, I guess, about 12 years ago when we or 14 years ago when we had sort of affordable care act and and which allowed to cover larger sort of the population that everybody should have health care which which it should uh but it did rise you know increase the the premiums for people who are so the healthier people it's it's a it's a standard you know a process healthier people pay for the sicker people but there's something that you had mentioned uh, around the personal responsibility that to me has not happened. Um, specifically in the U.S., um, I think the politicians sometimes, or even corporations, um, it's it's not uh, politically correct to say that we as people need to take responsibility or some responsibility towards our own health, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I remember growing up in India. I mean, my grandfather always used to tell us, and I remember I, mean, I was pretty young. I was a teen, late teens when I moved to U.S. But um, 
I remember as young as 10 years old, and my grandfather would say, nobody has dying from eating little less. <laughs> 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 and he lived up to, you know, 105. And he was not on a single medication. Um, wow. He's never taken Tylenol, never, you know, he wouldn't take any medication. But I'm not, I'm not vouching for that we shouldn't be any taking medication. But he worked out. He was running up to when he was like 80. Um, he worked out. He ate a balanced diet. And he would drink a huge glass of water before he ate any meal. And I would ask him, why do you drink before you ate any meal? And he said, then I will eat less. <laughs> so he was six, five foot, in, five inches tall. He was very tall, very thin, in, you know, but fit. He used, you know, and so I think there's a personal possibility that needs to take place. Um, there has been discussions in the past around, um, you know, consumer-driven healthcare plans, which provides incentives to people uh, that you know you'll cost more if you if you are not compliance with your medication or if you are not using the wellness type of, of prevention or or you're not physically active or you're not controlling your diet and so forth. Um, and, you know, they never went anywhere because of, again, you know, the issue around that we have a mentality that I want to do what I want to do. I just want to take a pill. I mean, that is the mentality that we have. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in, in medicine, uh, you know, you go to a doctor, they're, they're hesitant to tell you, don't eat this, don't eat that. They don't tell you that. Um, they're very kind and they, you know, they try to just, you know, tell you indirectly. And a lot of times patients just don't get it. Um, so I think there's a personal responsibility that needs to be baked into as part of the incentives that if you are healthy and, and 